Okay, good afternoon everyone. Uh, today I'm going to talk to you about uh, measurements we've done recently with looking at some micro drone UAVs, as Hughes just mentioned. It's an interesting su su subject, sorry. Uh, as well as measuring some bird signatures, which is again also very interesting. So, I'm going to introduce why, why we did this, uh, why it's of interest uh, as radar engineers, why we care about these things. Uh, look at the net red system, which everybody knows at the back of their hand. Um, maybe some new, new people to the group might want to learn a couple of things about it. And then talk about the, the micro UAV bird challenge. Is it a bird? Is it a plane? Which is the, the classic question. Show you some of the signatures we recorded with that radar on some experiments we did with Francesco Pirinelli and Virgo Torvik, our external PhD student. And then uh, conclude what we found out and what we're going to do next uh, and why. So, micro UAVs are a growing concern for a few different industries. Uh, nuclear power plants in France, uh, aviation is, is very much concerned. Uh, Star Wars filming sets or kind of stealing the rights to footage prior to, to their being released, um, as well as kind of uh, events with politicians or football games and things like this, where it's disruption being a cause. Uh, cause. And so far it's disruption, but there is great potential for this asymmetric threat to cause even, even worse things. Um, now, why, why are they challenging? Well, traditional radar systems aren't kitted out to, to detect such targets, really. Um, they're small, slow, and they fly low, this SSL uh, um, kind of acronym that they use for them, which makes them very challenging for traditional air traffic control-like systems. They can move within urban areas, which have a lot of um, clutter and shadowing, for a, a, a long-range radar system, and um, you can, they're easily deployable and, and can pop up, do what, filming or do whatever they want to do, and then disappear quite quickly as well. So it's, it's a real challenge for our, us as radar engineers to try and address this and look at what sensors would be suitable for them. Um, yeah, and I think it's an interesting challenge, so that's, that's what we look at. The NetRad radar is a radar system that's been developed at UCL over the past 10 plus years. Um, it's been used for measurements including wind turbines, human microdoppler, and now micro drones, uh, as well as a big sea clutter measurement campaign in collaboration with the University of Cape Town. The system's um, one of the unique aspects of the system is, is uh, it's a multi static, three node, coherent pulsed radar, which means we can deploy three radars, transmit from one, receive from all three and investigate what multi-statics provide in terms of additional information. How does looking at a target or a surface like sea clutter change depending on having a multi-static geometry? And that quickly <coughs> grows into a multi-dimensional <coughs> problem because of all the different possible geometries, polarimetries, waveforms, um, aspect angles, and all of these things. So there's so many things we can investigate with such a system. It's quite an interesting thing to work with. Uh, this is kind of the timeline of what the sea clutter measurements were, were, were performed back in 2010-2012 uh, timeline. And then since then, post that, it's more wind turbines, human microdoppler measurements that we've been looking at. And then the handover to the, the future system, NEXRAD, which will allow us to experiment with different uh, radar frequency bands, uh, different polarimetry, uh, and have a greater flexibility in our waveform. So this is, this is me describing the multi-static system, which I, which I was just mentioning before, and why we do it. You can deploy, deploy the system wirelessly operating between different nodes and be able to observe a target or a surface from many different aspect angles, transmitting from one radar, receiving from the, all of them, and then transmitting from another radar. And that, that brings opportunities in terms of trying to track, detect, or fuse data and fuse classifier information at different levels. So it's, it's a very interesting problem. This is what we're going to look at. Now, I'm not talking about the big um, kind of predator drones uh, that are uh, thousands of feet up in the air. I'm talking about small micro UAVs that are commercially available uh, on the market and uh, are kind of being used more and more prolifically. And in particular, this, the device that we, we measured um, is, is the one in the middle here, which uh, the radar group has uh, one of these units that we can use to test. Where did we do this? So we did this in, um, in Kent, near uh, Maidstone. 
in the, the Kent Downs, which is an area of outstanding national beauty, according to Google. And um, this is us deployed in the grounds of the house there. And we chose this location because there's a, a hawking center there where you can do um, falconry, where um, they have a number of trained uh, birds which uh, can leave from a glove of the handler and then fly onto another perch and then return to the, to the glove tempted by the food that's provided. And they have quite a vast array of different birds that they have there. Uh, and this is a, they, they have lots of falconry events and they were happy to just do and operate as they normally do, but with us with a sensor at a standoff distance observing the birds moving. What we did when we deployed the radar, here we can see Francesco um, debugging, and um, one of the nodes is over here, oh, the screen. and uh, the other node is here. We put two nodes at one location. That allowed us to measure the horizontal code polarization, so we're sending H and we're receiving H, but the node next to it was receiving V, so we could get a cross pole on the, on the, on the targets that were moving at that monostatic site. And then at the this short separation of only 30 meters, and we were closed in by the trees that were kind of working around, um, we, we deployed a bi-static node which had um, co-pole horizontal polarization. So that allowed us to compare a curve across and then a, a bi-static curve. Um, and during these measurements, we measured five different birds and one UAV once the birds were safely away from their UAV. They could have attacked it, wouldn't they? I think they would fully number it. Yes. <laughs> So, onto our targets of choice uh, at, at, the, uh, at the center. And they had various different birds that were available, and this was a first for them as well as it was for us. Um, so, we kind of learned as, as we went along. We started with the, the barn owl. We had two different barn owls. Um, they, they were quite, they were one of the smaller targets that, that they had. Um, they were also quite sleepy, so they, they weren't um, that active or in, encouraged to, to leave the perch and, and, and do our, one of the runs. I, sh I should have said in, in the previous slide here, in the geometry that I was describing, we pegged out on the floor a kind of a run that went directly towards the monostatic nodes, a run that went directly or roughly directly towards the bistatic node, and then a cross run which, which would be uh, perpendicular to the beams. And this is where we would like the birds to travel from the, from the two waypoints in these different measurements. And we set those waypoints up either with a, an individual holding a, the, the glove and a perch uh, at the other end, or just two perches and, and the, the people calling the, the bird to move from one place to another. So the barn owls we started with, and they were a challenging target, and I'll, I'll show that shortly. Um, and they also weren't that active, so we didn't get many repeats of those, those moving. So we moved on to a much bigger target, this uh, European eagle owl. Um, <coughs> which is a, a very big wing, wingspan, and it's a much larger bird compared to the barn owls. Um, so we saw uh, clear signatures on, on, on that bird, definitely. And then um, the, the, uh, the vulture, the hooded vulture, particularly ugly, but very good for this experiment. Um, it's, it's quite greedy, so if you put food there, it will fly to the location. So it flew back and forth many times. So that bird in particular, we got on each of those different runs. Compared to the other birds, we just got on the AB run that we, that we showed. So that, that, was, that was a very good um, a target for us to measure. And then it was the Harris Hawk here that we also got at the end, um, which, was, which was quite good um, a target to measure as well. So it's quite diverse in, in terms of the measurements. And I'll show um, <coughs> a few of these results that, that we detected. Something that Birger Torvik looked at, and his PhD and his domain of work is in the characterizing of small UAVs or birds, um, was he was interested in how the aspect angle of the bird changed if it went from A to B, or C to D, or E to F. And because that way, if the bird was moving in that direction, and the radar was perceiving the front of the bird to perhaps 30 degrees uh, aspect angle of the front of the bird, those variations in aspect angle are something of interest to, to Berger in terms of how the signal of the bird varies with that aspect angle. Uh, so Berger here <coughs> evaluated the different perceived aspect angle each of the radar nodes would see as the, ra as the bird would proceed from, from two of the waypoints. We haven't gone down into the characterization of how the data changed 
with these varying aspect angles. Some of them there's no change in aspect angle, some of them there's, there's quite a significant change. Um, <coughs> but that's something we'd like to investigate in the future. How how these signatures vary as the bird is, is moving left or right as it's as it's going through the beam. So now onto the onto the data. Some volume now. There's some guys who's saying something you want to say. So this is the, the, the vulture target. There's a monostatic and bistatic range result at the top here. And then this is a monostatic, bistatic, and monostatic cross-pole Doppler result. And I'm not showing this result in range because the signature was, was, was within the noise, really. We didn't detect it very well. It's very noisy. But when you go in the Doppler domain, this popped up a quite well, reasonably well, uh, because it's separated from the background clutter there. So this is the, the, the vulture moving between the two locations. And you can see the wings flapping, and then it goes into a gliding stage. And then the wings flap again just before it lands. If you look at the Doppler profiles here, you can see the flapping stage, the gliding, and then the flapping stage in the signature prior to it landing. Um, so we believe we were, we were observing the wing beats of, the, of, of this large bird as, as it was flying along. Um, here we had some interference in the bistatic node due to um, some of the RF uh, switching uh, parameters that we set that weren't ideal due to the restricted geometry that we had to work with. With a NetRed system, if we, if we could have pushed to a further range, but we were limited to small field or small front garden, basically, of, of the, the country house, we could have isolated the target away from this interference and had a much clearer signal. But we did some MTI filtering on the, ta on, on the targets just to provide um, the moving target information, and that did enhance this a bit more. But it's interesting to see that we were, we were detecting monostatic and bistatic um, uh, wing beats of the birds and uh, typical velocities and how they fly. So this is kind of our first run on this. Uh, we got some, we're happy to be able to detect them and see wing beats, which is an interesting thing to kind of classify one target from another. Moving on to again, one of the larger targets, this is Eurasian Eagle Owl, moving from perch to perch. With our MTI filtering, because the perches are stationary, they should be removed from our range profiles, and we should just be seeing the moving target, which is the bird. So again, uh, a clearer result in the monostatic problems with our, with our bistatic channel, um, but um, not quite as strong a signature between uh, the vulture and, and, and this Eurasian Eagle Owl. But the, the, the flapping is also not as present um, when we observed in the, in, in the Doppler domain. We did some, some characteristic uh, signatures here. The width of the, the, the signature is, is wider or fatter than what we're seeing, so a larger amplitude in general whilst gliding, but not as great um, as <coughs> characteristics from, from the wings, the wing of the birds. We should try and get the dimensions of the wings of each individual bird to see to see that, and I'm not sure if the makeup of those wings are different, whether one is more substantial than the other, which would, which would turn up greater on a microdoppler signature. Um, again, we're struggling with a, with a cross pole, but that's going to be suppressed anyway uh, due to the, the change in polarization. But there is some signature in there, but getting the detail of that is, is much harder, and you don't see the wing beats as, as you're seeing in the monostatic clear result. The smallest target that we had. Like, uh, as I mentioned previously, is, is the barn owl, um, which, if you saw during the, during the video there, was flapping more continuously during its um, oh, it um, during its um, uh, flight. So there wasn't so much a gliding stage, which is which is very much what you see. I'm just showing Doppler here, not range, because the target was very weak in the range domain. But after isolation in micro Doppler, it did stand out. Um, but looking in the micro Doppler. You can see a lot of flapping of the target, some gliding stage at the end there, but that's, that's quite a different characteristic signal compared to the vulture and the Eurasian eagle owl. Um, so you, you would certainly, by eye, the human could tell if you were trained, and you saw a few of these images, the microdoppler images, you could start differentiating between which, which bird and, and how, how, from how it's moved. Now onto the, the man-made flying object. This is the... <coughs> The DJI drone that I mentioned previously, running along up and down one of the runs that the bird was doing. Um, this drone was also detected um, in monostatically and, and bistatically with, 
than the interference. We have done measurements of this drone previously, so we know that the radar could observe it. Um, so we're happy to see it again on the day. Um, it's in horizontal polarization. The, the Doppler is completely different to the natural occurring bird target. You get these, I, I've extended the, 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 the range of the Doppler here to up to 500 hertz compared to the previous results, um, which was only showing uh, you know, 60 to 140 hertz. So it's much higher frequencies we're looking at here, and that's because of the rotations of the, 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 the rotor blades when you're observing it in H-pole. And we, were, we had carbon fiber blades on, on the drone that day. So you can see these, these wispy shapes here are all due to the rotation of those four blades of the quadcopter. So from the, from the range domain, you could easily mistake this as a bird target. And that's one of the key challenges um, of deploying a, a potential micro UAV deterrent radar at an airport, for example. If you tune the radar in, into these kind of targets, these slow moving, small targets, the number of false alarms that would start appearing would be, would be massive because the sheer number of birds in, that, that live around airports, I believe. I believe. Um, so if you just look in the, in, the, in the range domain, you could easily mistake this for, for a bird. But when you start looking in the microdoppler domain, there's so much information here that would allow you to discriminate <coughs> between bird or, um, or drone. These rotor blades, we were operating in a quite close range situation. And I'm, I'm not saying you will always see these, these rotor blade flashes or, or characteristic signals at very long ranges, or it was purely plastic blades being used. Um, so then you might have to look into more of the detail of how the main body is moving. And I think there is flight pattern characteristics that would be markedly different between how a drone moves and how the bird moves. Um, the drone can be quite jerky in, in its motion, especially when it's turning, it kind of tips and then tips like this where a bird flight is much more smooth in the way it's, it would be flying. So I think if you're going to try and address this challenge, you need to look at the microdoppler and the flight patterns in the Doppler domain. Uh, and as the range information alone is not sufficient. <coughs> so it's just a quick summary of some experiments we recently completed. I showed you the signatures from three different birds and one drone. We saw similarities between the birds, some differences in their flight patterns. Uh, and then the market dis difference in the, the drones microdoppler signatures. I think um, we're happy that we detected the birds as the first off. We're happy that we were able to run an experiment with a radar and birds. They say don't work with, with children and animals. I think you shouldn't work with radars and animals. It, it's always a, a big challenge. And um, we observed the microdoppler signatures of these birds uh, and the, the, the kind of the beat rate uh, of them whilst they're flying. Um, beating their wings and their gliding stages of their flight as well, which was interesting. We can align that to the videos that we have. Um, the drone signature was comparable to one of the larger birds in the range domain, but in the microdoppler domain, it was vastly different. Um, the issues we had that I mentioned during the experiments was we were kind of limited by the, the short location we could operate in within the garden grounds. Um, the birds were flying, if you saw in the videos, they were actually flying very low, kind of swooping along the ground and then up to the perch. This wouldn't necessarily be the type of free flight uh, in the open that you, that you would be interested in. And so there might be multi-pass effects off the ground or harder to detect and we're getting a smaller signature anyway. Um, so that might not be atypical of some kind of free flying birds measurements. Um, and there was interference within that uh, by static node, so we didn't have a nice, clear, clean by static channel to be able to compare back to the monostatic. But that's something that we can rectify in a, in a future measurement if we, if we go back and, and, and gather further data and a better geometry. Uh, so again, further, further experiments, investigate the polarimetry ratios. I think that's a really interesting thing to look at, especially during the beat flapping phase, something that Berger uh, uh, has uh, some interest in. Um, longer recording times to get better understanding of flight patterns and flight profiles. And um, yeah, further targeting different geometries uh, to, to investigate this uh, more extensively. Uh, but thank you, and any questions?